Jeff Smith and welcome to the Secrets of Success. Throughout my life, I've been fascinated by one single question, and it's how do successful people become successful? What is it that makes that big difference in our lives? Over the last 40 years, I've interviewed rich people, famous people, and many millionaires to find out their secrets of success and to share them here with you. Of course, success is not always measured in money. And in these programs, I'm looking at many different success stories from people in all walks of life. I want to find out what makes them tick, how they overcame adversity to keep on going, and I want to extract those magical nuggets of wisdom so that you too can implement the secrets of success into your own life. In this episode, I'm talking with Zara Carson. She's the lady who says, get zend. Certified in mindset coaching and neuroscience, Zara Carson is an inspirational public speaker as well as a trusted personal success coach to dozens of global executives. She's the best-selling author of her book, Six Weeks to Happy, and the creator of The Rewire System, a groundbreaking methodology that retrains your brain for greater happiness, health, wealth, and of course, success. So with over 20 years of experience as a top tier management consultant and corporate coach, goal setting and producing results, she says, became second nature to her. She now coaches corporations, business executives and industry leaders on how to achieve their career goals while also experiencing a more fulfilling life. Zara has awarded the Top 100 Healthcare Visionaries Award by the International Forum of Advancements in Healthcare. She holds degrees in psychology, applied positive psychology, neuroscience, and is a certified master neurolinguistic pressure, a life coach, master hypnotherapist, and master timeline therapy practitioner. She also continually advances her education quantum metaphysics and related fields to bring you the latest research and most innovative tools you can continue to achieve and thrive. Wow, that's a lot. That's a lot to get through. But that's not all. Zara sits on the board of World of Happiness Foundation, whose mission it is to create a world where we can be free, conscious and happy. She works on her passion project with the Steve Harvey Foundation to empower young people to move past limiting beliefs so they can live more powerfully. We've got lots to cover today. So let's bring in the amazing lady herself. Welcome to the show, Zara Carson. Thank you so much for having me, Jeff. I appreciate it. Oh, it's wonderful to have you here. You look amazing. So how are you doing today? I'm well, thank you. I feel I feel blessed and grateful. Very, very humbled to be here with you today. Oh, it's wonderful. Well, I can't wait to find out about the books you've written and to find out your secrets of success in all the incredible and amazing things that you achieved. But before we do that, I want to find out more about you, Zara. So three <laughs> questions for you. Where were you born? What was life like for you as a child? And what were your dreams and aspirations as you were growing up? Oh, three great questions. So I was born in South Africa during a a very turbulent time, during apartheid. So we had racial segregation and discrimination. It was a, you know, it was an interesting time to be in this world. And as a young person, I don't think you're equipped to process those challenging situations, they're really just too complex for a young mind. And what I came to discover was when you're little and you come across something that you can't really explain but feels wrong, your little unconscious mind starts to search for a story to add meaning. And my little story became the story, I'm, I guess I'm not enough because of whatever, the color of my skin, maybe because I'm a girl, whatever reason. And that became a universal theme, as, as I'll talk about later on in the show. 
your second question was what was what were my dreams and aspirations as a child? Yeah. You know, I always knew I wanted to marry the worlds that I loved, I, I, you know, and the things that I love to do. I love to travel and explore and I love to be with people and assist and be of service and support people in some kind. And I knew I wanted to really help change the world and to work with children at a, at a particular point. I just didn't know how I was going to do it. But I had this deep inner knowing that I was going to be okay and that I was going to do well in life. And so in those moments that became challenging or difficult where, you know, you could feel yourself spiraling or wonder, is this going to be okay? I just had this knowing like it was going to be fine. It was going to work out great. I just had to have faith and just breathe and get through it one day at a time. And then your last question, what was your last question again? Well, the the three were, um, where were you born? Which you've answered that one. You've answered your dreams and aspirations. The other one was, what was life like for you growing up? Which I think you've kind of answered. Yes, I did sort of answer that. So I had that, you know, that initial story running in my in my unconscious. So we're 5% conscious mind, 95% unconscious, subconscious. And the little story that was running in my unconscious beyond my awareness was, I guess I'm not enough, not good enough. And that can take so many different permutations. I'm not smart enough, not clever enough, not resourceful enough, not, you know, not capable enough, not wealthy enough to access education, not thin enough, pretty enough, whatever. Um, And I think it's a very relatable story because in my research, in my later days having a coaching practice, it became one of the five main themes of limiting beliefs and strategies that people, you know, live by, not consciously, obviously, at an unconscious level, that stop them and interrupt their life. So, you know, later on in life, how that played out was, I went about my life, you know, I was a happy kid. I had lots of friends, you know, had a wonderful childhood as much as we could. Then we moved to Canada during a a political uprising in South Africa that happened in 76. And uh, it was very different. Life was different, you know. Again, as a small child, not understanding the concepts of moving from a segregated society to an integrated society I just, my little mind didn't understand, you know, the differences of cultures and skin colors. And it didn't care because as human beings, we don't really care. That stuff is taught. And so, you know, I was, I was making interesting little choices and patterns, not understanding for a few years that there was a difference in how we were living, you know. So that was really interesting. And then later in my teen years, I caught myself thinking it again. Oh, I guess if I was you know, this skin color or looked this way or felt that way, then my choices and my opportunities would be different. And I said, whoa. (laughs) (laughs) Because it had had just lived in the background for so long and I thought I was past it. Sure. But of course it wasn't. And so when that came into my awareness, I said, oh, I think I was, I was close to 19 at the time. And I said, well, this is not aligned with the big life that I see for myself. I want a life that I'm excited by. I want a life that charms me. I want to wake up, you know, feeling like, wow, I can't believe this is my life, like a dream life, if you will. And this little story played no part in that. So I said, I need to figure out how to shift this. And that was the start of my journey. And that's what led me here. Okay. So I just want to rewind a little just to make a point here. And, and that is, you said, I knew what I wanted, but I didn't know how. Yes. Now, the reason I'm rewinding back to this, and we'll come on to it in a little while. Lots of people have dreams and aspirations, but in many cases, they don't know how. Mm-hmm. And that causes them to give up altogether for all kinds of reasons. And I'm going to come back to you with that later. But I wanted to bring it up now because it's really, really important. So throughout this program, we're going to be talking about the relationships that exist between happiness and success. 
which Zara is one of your specialities. <laughs> so, <laughs> so before we move forward, perhaps we should define what those two things mean to you. You're quoted as saying, and I love this, I chased happiness until it made me miserable. <laughs> <laughs> I love that well, because it's quite profound. So here are my questions for you. What is happiness? How can we recognize it? And what are the steps we need to take to achieving happiness in our lives? You know, it, it seems like an easy question, and yet it's not an easy answer. And I think that's why we are all in search of it, right? That's why yeah. I think we're all exploring what that is. And so in all of my research, what I've come to understand is, number one, it's not a one-size-fits-all answer. It's very personal and we are all unique in literally every single way. What you like to eat, how you like to exercise, how much sleep you need, how much social activity you need, the type of love and affection you need, what are your financial goals, how you define success. And it really is very personal. I think most of us go through this life with a set of milestones. We're just given this basic set of instructions to live life. Do well in school, then maybe choose a college or university, pick a major, then choose a career and start there, then get the house, get the car, get the kids, maybe get a dog. And somehow happiness is just magically going to turn up at some point, you know. But it doesn't work that way. So it sent me down a whole path of exploration for what, what is happiness? What is the mind? What is the soul? Where does it live? And how can we access it? And I came to realize that we actually have four bodies. We have a spiritual or energetic body. We have a mental an emotional and a physical body. Now, most people think of the physical body in terms of nutrition and exercise and maybe sleep, but your physical body actually acts as a gauge for how you're doing elsewhere in life. You know, and I think very few people understand unless you have some sort of spiritual practice or unless you're studying the world of science and, and quantum physics and the, and the universe and the body of energy and what that means, energy flowing in and out. If you've studied the secrets of success or the law of attraction, then you have some idea of, you know, what you put out there, the energy you put out and how to bring that back. And it can be positive or negative. So how do you stay in a positive mindset? Because happiness isn't really just turning a frown into a smile. It's not about being in a smile all day long. It's really about, it includes an optimal state of physical well-being. So you do have to look after your physical body because honestly, if you don't have your health and if you're in pain and you're suffering, it's very difficult to get through the day, let alone feel, feel joy. Secondly, it has to incorporate a sense of being in control, in conscious control of your thoughts, your feelings, and your behaviors in a, in a given day, in a given moment even. And so happiness really is a very personal solution where you get to consciously choose how you want to think and feel every day. And most of the world lives on autopilot. We all live in that unconscious mind that, you know, 95% of us that's, that's living in, in beyond our awareness and so we're running on autopilot every day. And when you're running on autopilot, what happens is you wake up and you have this start of, you know, thoughts. Oh, I'm feeling tired. I don't know if I have enough energy to get through the day. Oh, my gosh, I have a job. I have a, a spouse. I have children to look after. I have a house to look after. Am I going to have enough energy? Am I going to have enough time? Am I going to have enough money? Then your money worries start. You know, oh my gosh, I haven't even started planning for retirement. And 92% of Americans haven't, they don't have a financial plan. So the stress of living from day to day is a lot. And so you spiral down this unconscious pattern of thinking and feeling, and then the behaviors follow because they're disappointing and deflating already. That's not the day you're going to get your goals achieved. If you can instead learn the tools to retrain yourself, retrain your brain, and retrain your your choice is really starting your day intentionally choosing to think and feel at a higher level in a positive mindset, then everything shifts. Because now instead of waking up feeling you know, deflated and disappointed, you're waking up 
and you're being able to consciously say, you know what, I'm in a state of gratitude. I feel blessed today. I have so much energy for the day. I'm excited to get started on my goals today. I'm excited to get started down this path towards what I know I need to achieve so that I can live my best life. So I think happiness, it is a personal answer and it does include a physical state of well-being and we really have to have all four bodies aligned so that we can almost vibrate at the level of happiness. And then what comes out of that are those beautiful feelings we all want to feel, you know, freedom, certainty, deservedness, love, joy, but true joy, you know, and I, I think many, many people really suffer with having access to that each and every day. There's so much in that answer that you gave. And I, I will be rewinding and coming back to it for sure. There's so many things in there. And I don't want to tackle it now because I know you've devised a system called Rewire. Yeah. And a lot of Rewire will um, address or explain further what you just said. So rather than ask you another question, I'm going to wait and we're going to talk about rewire. So that that's happiness. It's a state. It's personal. It's kind of intangible. Um, <clears throat> but how we get it, we're going to come on to in a little while. My question was about the relationship between happiness and success. So now we've done happiness. Now my question is about success. So success is not always about money. I mean, when I was younger and I started my journey, my first question was, how does a millionaire become a millionaire? But later on, you find out that it's not about money. Success means different things to different people. So my question for you now, Zara, is what does success mean to you right now? And do you have a template for success? I do have a template for success and I, you know, so I've kind of created a, what I call a winning formula for happiness and success. And I put that into, into the book, six weeks to happy and the rewire system, which is the methodology in the book, because I really, I, it took me such a long time to come to this myself. And I think success used to be defined in terms of money, fame, and power, you know, as you said, when you're interviewing the millionaires, but they're not always happy. Absolutely. Yeah, so, absolutely. What I figured out is that success can live without happiness, but happiness usually includes some measure of success because unless you're a monk living, you know, in, in an ashram or a retreat and, and you're just working for your room and board, the rest of us live in a civil society and unfortunately it takes money. We have to pay our bills and so there's there's survival based needs. And then there's how much more do we need in order to really thrive? And so success for me means, am I aligned in all areas of life? So are my financial needs being met? Are my physical needs being met? Am I looking after my body? But not just my body. Is my physical environment as I need it to be so that I feel the most peaceful? You know, for example, if you are, if you were a person that likes things to be minimally styled and, and clean and organized in order for you to think straight, but your house is full of clutter, that's not going to work. So you have to be in control of everything in your physical environment as much as possible. And then mentally, emotionally, am I getting the right intellectual stimulation. I now know the things that make me feel most alive. I'm happiest when I'm productive. Yes, I like to take a holiday and rest and recharge, but there's also a piece of me that misses it. So I'm, I find I'm constantly learning. I'm constantly reading because that's what, what excites my mind. I need that constant stimulation and challenge. And then emotionally, am I having my needs met with my family, with my loved ones, you know, in my social community and learning that fine balance of how to measure my energies. And of course, then having enough to, to really live the sort of quality of life that I want to, which includes not just enjoying the beautiful luxuries that I've worked so hard for, but also um, having the humility and the gratitude for those blessings that have come into my life. 
and being able to give back, being able to help others do that for themselves, being part of the World Happiness Foundation, getting to work with children and really seeing them light up. So passion and purpose is definitely a part of my formula of success as well because, you know, in all of my studies what I've discovered is we are all uniquely gifted. We all have particular strengths and talents and they're usually connected to what your purpose is meant to be in life. And purpose is a word that can scare some people. So, you know, some people think, oh my gosh, I have to donate oodles and oodles of time or money to a particular cause. It's not the only way to give back. It's not the only way to have purpose in your life. If you can tap into what your unique strengths and talents are and figure out how to use them, how to connect with people, it could be an act of service. It could be if you're a musician or you like to make people laugh. Maybe you just bring those gifts to bring joy to the world or bring laughter to the world. So, you know, once you tap into that, and, you know, one of the founding fathers of the positive psychology movement, Chris Peterson, said this perfectly. When he was asked to define positive psychology, and he said it in three words, he said, other people matter. And what he meant by that is the minute you get outside of yourself and you're doing things for other people, whether it's at risk, you know, a group that's at risk or the less fortunate, you realize your stuff just fades into the background anyway. And you realize how many common points there are in this thing called humanity and this experience of being a human being. So for me, success includes, you know, waking up in a state of peace, being able to choose how I want to think and feel in every moment, being able to choose how my day goes within reason, life events happen, of course, you know, having loving, connected relationships with my family, which takes work, you know, and friends and social community and having enough of everything I need in life so that my needs are covered. And what I came to discover in my coaching practice when I was working with clients in helping to achieve their goals and then setting a plan is when I had them visualize that end goal, very few of them could actually tell me that achieving that goal would bring them any closer to happiness. And I thought, well, why on earth are we working this plan then? <laughs> Whose goal are you pursuing? <laughs> And I think this is common to most people because, again, we're yeah. given basic marching orders in life. And so most people are living either somebody else's expectations of life and love and career. And so what I've done is I've designed a template sort of for how you can figure out what your personalized plan is for happiness. And that's the starting point to figure out what's happiness and success for you because it is very personal. Great. Well, we'll come on to that later. <clears throat> so I'll put your information in the show notes because I'm sure people are saying, hey, how do we get hold of that? Well, we'll tell you right at the end. Okay. So already you've mentioned some things that I just can't let go. I was going to wait, but I can't let go. <laughs> I love it. You, <laughs> we have four bodies. You've mentioned our soul. You've mentioned spirituality. You've mentioned the universe. But you just mentioned there that something that comes up quite a lot, which is purpose. And I get asked quite frequently, hey, Jeff, how do I find my purpose? How will I know? So... I'm going to pass that one to you, Zara, if I may. <laughs> Absolutely. I actually put a little formula together when I work with children because, I, you know, children are they're so stressed these days, far more stressed than I think we were when we grew up because they now have social media and they have access to so much more social comparison. And that is social comparison is not a healthy formula for success. So, um how I describe purpose to children is the same as how I would describe it to adults. If you can figure out the things that excite you, what are the things you really enjoy? So if you enjoy entertaining people or make, making people laugh, or if you enjoy bringing structure to chaos or unstructured things or improving things or fixing things, that's one of your talents. And if you then look at 
the things that you are naturally gifted for. Some people are athletically gifted. Some people are academically gifted. Some people are musically gifted. Some people are gifted in terms of how they connect with people. Like some people are just networkers. They know how to connect people. They know how to build rapport really quickly with people. And so if you can figure out two parts, what you're uniquely talented and gifted for, and the other part is what you enjoy, and then you marry the two and find some examples of how you can use the things that excite you, the things you enjoy doing and spending your time on with what you're naturally good at. It's usually where your purpose lies is in that middle ground there. Okay. It takes a little bit of trial and error, a little bit of exploration. Like I always knew from a young age, I loved helping people. My mother thought I would always bring home strays, and I just was always trying to help people in need. So I knew that that was probably one of my natural uh, gifts, but also what I enjoy. And then I love learning, and I love um, what I'm really good at is strategic thinking. I see patterns in things, and so. I saw patterns in my coaching clients and I saw patterns in all of the data that I studied. It didn't matter if it was psychology or neuroscience or positive psychology or process engineering. I would see how to pull things together in a really simple way. And I thought, oh, I love helping people and I can pull together complex concepts and I'm great at teaching and training and coaching. So maybe that's my purpose. And here I am years later, doing that for a living and, and dedicating my life to helping others. So that's kind of how you would go about it. And it takes a little trial and error, but if you can manage to pull those two things together, not only are you helping with your with your gifts, but you're also enjoying it as you do it. And you get paid too. There's the third, yeah. there's the third part of it. So if you can match all three, fantastic. Now, here's an interesting one. I've struggled with this one myself over the years, I think I have the answer for me, but with your psychology background, I want to pass this one to you. Imagine you found your purpose. You deliver your purpose. It's done. Then what? I don't think it's ever done. I'm not sure I agree with that. Okay, let me give you, let me give you an example. I believe my purpose was to write one of the books that I've written. Yes. When, when I'd finished writing it, when I had done the deed, here's how I felt. I believed that was my purpose, and now my purpose is fulfilled. Now, mm. I, now I have nothing, and I was deeply disturbed deeply now i don't want you to psychoanalyze me no, <laughs> we, we can do that we can do that after the show but i i found my answer to that one yes. i'm i'm just wondering there'll be someone else listening now go oh yeah that's me i found it delivered and now i feel wow whatever it is the, the feeling is it's that, well so that's a great question and thank you for asking it and, I, and i've had a similar journey because you know, when I first discovered all of these amazing tools and I, you know, I, how my story started was really, I was, as a management consultant, I was working really large projects. I mean, up to $45 million projects with team sizes of 200. That's an incredible amount of stress to manage. And it was wonderful. I did an amazing job. I did really great. I had so much fun sitting at the executive table with the big boys and you know, I, I did it at a very high level and a, a great level of mastery, but I, I neared burnout at that point, and I thought there has to be more, and so I took a little time off, and I started, well, I had been studying self-development, self-analysis, positive psychology, the study of happiness for, you know, 20, 30 years at that point, and I said, and my, my marriage was breaking down at that time, and I just, I was, I was tapped out. I was completely depleted of energy. And I said, something needs to change. This can't be right. I have chased what I thought success would be. And everyone from the outside would say, oh, she's very well put together. She's done amazing in her career. She's financially more than fine. She has a great life. She can vacation. She, can, she doesn't have to worry about things. That, that should be a measure of success. And I thought that it was. And yet there was something definitively still missing. And so when I started down this path of trying to discover how to find my own peace again, 
it was so fast. It was within a few weeks. And I said, oh, this is amazing. I want to help people do this. And so the first thing I thought is I'm going to build an app. I'm going to build an app and I'm going to layer all of these tools in the, in the app. And there is an app called Get Zen, which I released in 2016 now. And it's going to have all the greatest tools. And then I put it out in the world and it did really well. And like you, I said, okay, now what? Well, the next part was, okay, now you have to sell and you have to market the app because like a book or any other business, you can't just <laughs> throw it out there. Yeah. Nothing happens. <laughs> right. so now you have to learn to sell it. So, okay, I have to acquire sales skills. No, the marketing team said, we want you to write a book because it's going to add credibility to the app. And I said, well, okay, well, a book has been on my list for a while. I wasn't sure what I wanted to write about. I, I loved creative writing when I, when I was younger and I took many, many classes. So I, I knew I was good at it what's the content? What am I going to write about? What's the message that's going to connect with people? So I wrote just a marketing book to add credibility for the app. Nope, that wasn't done. So what I've come to discover in my course of searching for my purpose is it's sort of, we are always a work in progress, right? We are always evolving as human beings. We're always learning and growing and expanding our conscious awareness. So what I've come to realize is you're going to deliver your purpose according to where you are in your learning. And then as you evolve, it's going to shift and change course. It's going to shift and change course just like you do. So the app came out. I had to learn how to sell it. Okay, so now I'm learning sales skills. Now I'm writing a book. That turns into a happiness boot camp on a different TV show, which doesn't even exist anymore. But that was my first time. And I said, okay, now I'm done. Nope. <laughs> Not done yet. <laughs> then my marriage ends. I end up on a trip to Italy with my girlfriend, and I just I wanted to go somewhere and, and light up again. When you've gone through something so traumatic as the end of a, a relationship and a marriage, you know, it's one of five significant life events for an adult. And most people don't actually know this. I'm just going to cover them briefly because I think it's genius. The five significant events that an adult goes through are loss or change of job, planning a wedding, getting married or divorced, grief, so losing someone, and then moving house or building a home. These are really the five major things that really plague us. So I had gone through this major life event and I needed to find myself again. I was worn, I was emotionally drained, I was mentally just broken. You can't function in that space. So I took a long holiday. And I literally was, I was on the Amalfi Coast. I was, it was in between seasons, so there were no boats running. And so I had to take this big tour bus down this medieval mountain road, which was quite scary because you had this steep drop down to the sea on one side. So I sat on the inside, scaredy cat that I am. And I literally just had this moment where I looked up and I said, okay, universe, okay, source, tell me show me what I'm meant to do here. Because I built this app, I wrote the book, I wrote the coaching program, that wasn't enough. What's next? And they showed me, well, well, or I saw, however you want to say that, what I saw in that moment was a new book with a title and a book cover very clear and then interviews like podcasts and TV shows and radio now you have to remember, I was a management consultant at that time. I was working large corporate projects. So this was completely out of left field. I had no idea what to do with this information. I said, are you sure? Like, oh, okay, that sounds fun and interesting, but I don't see that, that coming to play. And I just shelved it. And I said, okay, seven years later, here I am. I've written the book. It was published last year. And now I'm busy promoting it and selling it. And I'm happier and more aligned and more at peace than I've ever been. So in my search for purpose to, to concisely answer your question, it's going to shift and change as you do. And that's okay. Mm. And well. that's okay. It doesn't end if you don't want it to. You just keep going and find that next way to connect with people like your podcast. Yeah. Well, <laughs> there's three things I want to bring up here. 
<laughs> the first one, which is to do with a question, which was, we've attained our purpose, then what? Mm -hmm. What I learned after that, I, I traveled the same journey as you did in that when I didn't know what my purpose was, I did exactly what you just said. I went into the quiet and mm -hmm. I asked the universe, whatever the universe is, I asked the universe. It took a little time. It took a little practice. It came to me and then the book was born. I completed the book, which was an incredible high. Um, but then I finished this and I was left completely empty. I can't think of another word. My life was empty. It was, what do I do now? I have no purpose. Mm -hmm. So then I go back to the universe and I ask again, as did you. And it came to me that we don't have a purpose. We have multiple purposes. Mm -hmm. And just like you say, they evolve as we evolve. And just like you, things came to me. And first of all, you think, how on earth? That, that's, that's not me. But we don't know what the journey ahead holds for us. Yes. And so other purposes, multiple purposes have come from, some of which we spoke about mm -hmm. before we came on air today. Yes. So a um, so couple of things. If you're trying to discover your purpose, do as Zara did, go into the silence, ask the universe, see what happens. Don't necessarily expect an answer right away. It might take a little while. And then the other thing is we don't have a purpose. We have multiple purposes. Now, talking about evolving, I don't know whether you found this, Zara. When I started writing the book, it was a year before I finished writing the book. By the time I finished, I knew I was a completely different person at the end of the book than I was at the beginning. Now, I've got the advantage here, folks. I've got Sarah on screen here, and she's nodding, nodding vigorously, saying, oh, yeah, 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 I can relate to that. And so we change so much. So my third question for you, that, that was to wrap up on purpose, really. I've, I've done plenty of research on you, and I've seen you speak many times, and what comes across to me all of the time, in every case, even right now, is your calmness and serenity. Mm. How do you do it? You're amazing at it. <laughs> It, it took some practice, but honestly, it didn't take much. And I would say that I am the biggest skeptic. You know, I was raised with the concept of meditation my whole life. And it was, it was, you know, I resisted it for many years. And then as I started studying positive psychology, there were, there were basically five permeating themes. One was practice gratitude. Okay, what is that? Some people journal. Some people talk about things that they're grateful for at the start of the day and end of the day. But what it does is it shifts your mindset away from what you're missing in life and what you're lacking and that scarcity mindset into what you already have. What are the blessings that already exist in your life? And when you're in a, in a moment of feeling grateful, you can't feel grateful and stressed at the same time. You can't feel blessed and stressed at the same time, right? You can feel grateful and joy at the same time. You can feel grateful and love at the same time. And so it really raises your vibration. And this is something that people don't really talk about. It raises your emotional vibration, your energetic vibration, if you will, to one of love and compassion and gratitude. And so that's very powerful. The second piece is we have to learn to quiet our mind. And most people wake up every day. What do most people do? They'll coffee, they'll shower, they'll 
grab their phone, they'll turn on the news. That doesn't work for me. It makes me feel really stressed. Now, I understand the concept of waking up to go into a big job. And I had a big job for many years where, you know, you want to gear up for battle almost. Like you need to get that energy up. And that for me was my drive into work. I would power the music up and I would just, you know, pump my energy and get it up. So by the time I reached the office, I was ready to go. But I didn't want to start the day feeling like I needed to immediately put on the armor. I wanted to start my day off feeling peaceful. And so when I took this little break, when my marriage was spiraling and, well, when it ended and I was just completely depleted, I really just started by asking myself the question. Actually, it was my, I think it was my unconscious mind that asked me the question. I just sat there. I poured myself a cup of coffee and I sat on the couch. I was looking out on the water and I just said, I'm so tired. Like, what do I how do I how do I change this? How do I shift this? I don't want to feel this way anymore. And a little voice inside me said, Well, how do you want to feel instead? And I just, it was an immediate answer. I said, I want to feel peaceful and calm and happy. And I didn't really want to start the practice of meditation. I just really sat in silence for five to seven minutes a day is how it started. And I just focused on feeling utterly peaceful. I just quieted my thoughts and I let that feeling wash over me. And so now understanding neuroscience and understanding how the brain and the central nervous system work, when you are not just focused on the word peaceful, but really embodying what that feels like, whether it's going back to regenerate a memory of when you were your most at peace or a string of moments when you felt most peaceful. Maybe it was playing with your kids. Maybe it was having some puppy time with your dogs. Maybe it was on a vacation. You know, that first moment when you put your feet in the sand and you feel the ocean wash over you, or maybe your happy place is the mountains. Whatever that moment is for you, visualize it and just let it flood your neurology, flood every cell in your body with that vibration. Then I went into feeling happy. What are the moments in my life that make me feel the most joy? Or what are the moments I want to imagine in my future self, my future life, that will bring that happiness to me? And then a feeling of utter calm. And I swear within three weeks, everything started to shift. And so now that's how I wake up every morning. I wake up and I intentionally start my day by saying, I want to feel peaceful, calm, and happy. And then I go into a visualization meditation of how I want my day to go, how I want my next few months to go, how I want my life to be. And the most incredible thing is you can learn, you know, the secret laws of attraction and how to manifest. But the minute your your internal energy is calm and you've quieted your mind, amazing things start to happen amazing things start to happen. I will think, oh, I need to, I need a new contract. And literally within the same day, it will show up. Or I need to meet a client that can do this, or I need to find a business partner that can do this. And the doors just start opening because I have now figured out a way to harmonize my energy with what the universe is flowing back to me. And if you can stay positive and light in those positive states of mind, then you're in a state of flow. In in athletics, they call it being in the zone. It's that same feeling where you're not really thinking thinking of anything specifically, but you just have this deep knowing that everything is going to come together easily and effortlessly. And, and, And once you start doing that, that feeling lasts with you for at least a day and a half. So you can even miss a day of, of meditation that sort, that's my sort of meditation. And that feeling will stay with you for the day. So that's that's how I produce it. I hope that it. If someone wanted to learn this skill, Zara, how would they go about the beginning this journey? Well, I would say that's a good place to start. Is for the first thing you need to do is just suspend your disbelief. You know, we'll go and see Top Gun or Mission Impossible, and when Tom Cruise jumps out of a plane and somehow manages to land on his feet without injury we go wow that's amazing but when it comes to setting a similar goal for ourselves in our lives that may seem lofty all of these doubts come up all I want people to do is just set the intention my intention years ago 
was what if I could marry the things that I love? I love to travel and explore. I love to meet different people. I love to work with people. I love to work with kids. And I want to make money helping people. I didn't know how it was going to happen. I just put the intention out there, married together kind of the formula I wanted for what would bring me the happiest life where I was thriving. And then I just allow myself to daydream about it as much as I can throughout the day. Because the minute you're in that mindset and you can see yourself accomplishing the end state, what I would say is you need a visual, you need an auditory, and you need a kinesthetic representation. So what are you going to see when you've reached that goal? What are you going to hear when you've reached that goal? And how are you going to feel? And if you can really get into that moment and suspend all the doubts, suspend all your disbelief, and really allow yourself to visualize the end state, it starts to gradually shift your mindset and rewire your brain, rewire your neurology, and retrain the brain from instead of being an autopilot to say, instead of not, not today, it's going to say, oh my gosh, yes, I can. Today's the day I'm going to get started. Today's the day I'm going to start towards my goal. So, so that's number one. And then the other tools I have, of course, in the rewire system, a whole six-week program where you get to learn the science of happiness and you get to learn three tools per week and put them into practice where you get to align the four body system and bring yourself back to happiness. And with that, you learn about what your inner dialogue is. You learn about the unconscious beliefs that you're holding that are stopping you from having the joy, the wealth, the health, the success you want in your life, the happiness you want and to rewire back to balance so that you can have those things in align with them. Okay, I'm, I'm going to question you more on rewire in a moment. But before we do that, you're a mindset coach. You've yeah. written two books and you, like me, are fascinated in what makes people successful. Yes. So let's kick this off then with your latest book. I love the title, by the way. Six weeks to happy. <laughs> so here are my questions. Why did you decide to write this book? What is it about and who is it for? Oh, great question. Well, very much like you, we have, we have quite a similar journey. I have also became fascinated with two groups of people. One is, you know, who are the groups of people that manage to have success and also extreme success because there's some people that have you know a small vision for their life i think i'm going to get a job and as long as i have a, a house and can pay my bills and look after my family i'm happy but then there are those who want the plane who want the you know extreme success the millionaires the billionaires and what is it that separated them that gave them this massive vision for themselves and why do you know why do the rest of us not even allow ourselves to have that kind of access or have that vision for ourselves. And then I also became really fascinated with another group of people who were, you know, that have that little sparkle in their eye. When you meet them, you just know they know something the rest of us don't. Like they have a little, they know the secrets to life and happiness. I want to I want to interview them as well. And so those two groups of people became my fascination and I became fascinated with the gap. What is it that separates most of us that were getting stopped in life, and I was one of them in the past, although I had a vision for something different, you know, what is it that separates most of us from wanting bigger and better and being able to achieve those things and that group that can be happy and successful and achieve extreme, extreme scenarios of, of success and that dream life scenario. And in my own course of study, I really was starting out trying to discover it for myself because I just wanted to create it for myself. Now I had a very successful career. I made more than enough money. I had a really nice quality of life. I wanted for nothing, but I was stressed and I went down this path of finding that peace. And so I said, okay, I'm going to build the app. The app shifted to a book. The book became another book. I started a coaching practice and I loved working one-on-one -on -one with people it was so rewarding to see people really transform in front of me because, you know, when you train as a coach, you learn to read people's physiology. So, you know, when someone comes to you and, and, and it's a friend and they say, and you say, how are you? And they say, oh, I'm good. 
but you can see the stress on their face. You can see that there's something unhappy in their life mm. and they won't discuss it. Totally incongruous you, answer. Yes, you can see it in the neurology. Meanwhile, someone falling in love, oh my gosh, they have a glow about them. They have a different energy about them, right? And, and when you're falling Absolutely, in love, yeah. you so many more people because you're radiating that energy. You're radiating that hope and that light and that excitement. And so... In my coaching practice, I started to notice patterns of behavior. I started to notice that most people fell into one of five categories of limiting beliefs, and then the limiting beliefs are attached to patterns of behavior that play out. So we evolved to be really good at survival. We actually didn't evolve to be good at happiness or success, and so sometimes our core primitive nature to be wired for survival is counter to our goals towards happiness and success. And so we always have this inner conflict and I was fascinated with why that is and how can we tap into peak potential and human performance and what is that? And so I came to understand that we are 5% conscious mind, 95% unconscious. And until we bring those unconscious fear patterns to our conscious awareness, will never be in control of them. So the, the five patterns I have, we probably don't have time to get into all five, but I'll just cover them briefly. The first one is, you know, we've all heard this one is that I'm not enough, some form of I'm not enough, I'm not good enough, smart enough, capable enough. The next one is I'm alone, I don't have support in this world. But these limiting beliefs and, and the patterns of behavior, they don't show up as obviously as that. So the I'm alone one won't show up sounding or feeling like that. It's going to sound more like, you know, I've always had to do things for myself. If I want something done well, I have to do it myself. Um, and some form of that. And so if, if that's your underlying story that's running in your unconscious, it's, it's your operating system. It's your autopilot system running. And the next one is, I'm not safe. So if you have a feeling that you're not safe in this world, is it going to give you the ability to take a risk? Are you going to be able to invest in yourself when you need to learn core skills to start a business, to excel in your career, or to even trust someone in relationship, right? Absolutely. The next one is, I'm not deserving of wealth or success. And again, it's not going to sound like that. How it's going to play out is, you know, I'd love to start a business. I have a great idea for a business, but I don't know how, or I don't know where to start, or I don't have the financial capabilities to run a business. I don't have the business acumen to know how to even operate a business or a startup. Where would I start? What resources do I need? And so most people just stop there. But life doesn't have to be that way. Because it doesn't matter if you're trying to achieve a health goal or a love and connection goal or a wealth goal. If you're stopped by your unconscious patterns, then, then that's it. That's, that's your end point. And so it's a start and stop cycle. If you're starting a diet and you never can manage to lose that last 10 pounds because you're always losing willpower, always breaking your commitment. And that cycle is not an easy one. You know, we have to really talk about what it feels like when you start something or when you have a goal for something that's been left on the shelf for 10 years, the state of stress it puts you into, the state of stress it puts you into to live paycheck to paycheck when you know you want a bigger life for yourself, when you know you have a goal, when you know you have even an idea for a business that could really be something spectacular. There's a reason we have these ideas. It's because we are meant to evolve past these patterns. We are meant to bring these unconscious patterns into the foreground. And so in the book, I go into all the different permutations that I've seen. And so that was one of the themes I saw in my coaching practice. And then I wanted to understand why these five themes were showing up and why they were common. Like, what is this human journey? And why does it seem to be so common to and such a universal theme for most of us? And then I started practicing, you know, NLP and hypnotherapy. I saw very powerful results in all of my clients. 
And I decided I wanted to understand the science behind these results. Like why, why were these phenomenon happening? What's happening in the brain and the nervous system? And, you know, how can we tap into that unconscious and shift the story? How can we flip it on its head and really tap into that 95%? Because if we're only living in the 5% of conscious awareness, it's like Einstein. Einstein was able to tap into so much more. And he, of course, he was in the study of energy. So not shocking there. Um, but how do we tap into that 95% so that we can harness our own powers because we have them. We're just, because we evolved in such a strange way to be survival based, how do we retrain away from survival and fear and back to love and hope and certainty and, you know, that feeling of being worthy and deserving of love and success and happiness even. And so as I, I studied neuroscience and because I wanted to understand how does the brain catalog thoughts and feelings and where does all of this go and what is fight or flight? What is stress? How do we feel stress? How do we train away from it? And then I studied positive psychology because I wanted to understand really the science of happiness. What is it that takes us from neutral to living a great life and, and feeling well and having an optimal state of well-being? And what I came to see was all of that data was just confirming everything I found in my coaching practice. And I had been searching for years for how to help people coach themselves. So the one-on-one -on -one coaching was great because I could really see an immediate result in people. But this was such powerful information. I really wanted to share it with as many people as possible. So I said, I need to find a way to have people coach themselves. And then it just showed up and I said, okay, this is a book. This is, this is what, this is my next part of the purpose is I need to write this book. And the rewire system just, it pulled out almost visually in front of me. And I sat there one day with post-it notes and I just mapped it all out. And I said, this is it. This is what's going to help people. So we've discovered that the brain is actually not static in nature. It's dynamic. It's changeable. It's malleable. And so the concept of neuroplasticity means you don't have to go through that autopilot state of being. You can over a period of six weeks, which is where the brain shows lasting signs of change with conscious effort, and it doesn't take much. I promise you it's as little as 10 minutes per day if you can just focus your thoughts at the start of each day and then a little bit throughout the day. You start to shift that autopilot way of being to an intentional way of being where you can think, feel, and behave in new ways that are calmer, more peaceful, and yet more focused, more productive, more creative, more strategic, and much more empowering. And all it takes is six weeks. And that's why I created a six-week program. Beautiful. <clears throat> right. We're going to come on to the re Rewire program in just a moment, but I have another question first. You say you wake up and then you mentally prepare yourself. Mm -hmm. Now, do you do that immediately? You wake up, you lie in bed and you do it? Or do you get up? Do you sit in a chair? Do you have a drink? How does it work for you, Sarah? It depends where I am. If I'm at home, I like to do it in bed, but I'll wake up, I'll make my coffee. My morning routine is I'll I'll go and I'll get a few minutes of fresh air because the sunlight, you know, and when you when you study the world of neuroscience and and by you know, biology, you understand that the sun and being with nature actually is a very healing force. It's a healing energy and the sunlight, not blue light being in a building we were not meant to live in buildings we were meant to be with nature more so we have to get outside more and, and most of us don't do that so i start the day while my coffee is brewing i'll go out onto the balcony because i live in a in a condo and i'll just let the sun permeate my eyes and that basically lights up your mitochondria it gets your energy flowing in your body throughout the day and i'll grab my big cup of coffee and my vitamins and i'll i'll start my meditation so i start by opening up my, my chakras, so you're kind of an open channel. And the chakras are energy centers that align with your endocrine system as well in your body. And they can be 
you know, at times when, you know, those days when you wake up feeling off a little bit and you can't quite understand why you're in this funk, yeah. it's usually because one of your chakras have fallen out of balance either emotionally or physically. And you can, you can, you yourself can open them up. And there's lots of research on, on the net where you can find out how to, how to open your chakras using affirmation or visualization. So I start with that. So my channels are open and then I just, I sit and I usually put on a binaural beats, which is, I call it transformative tech. It's a technology in music that tunes your brain waves into a particular frequency. So we have different brain wave frequencies for, you know, agile activity for when we're at rest for when we are trying to relax. So this tunes your brainwave frequency into a more relaxed state of mind. So you take long, deep breaths. It triggers your parasympathetic nervous system, so it immediately calms you, slows down your heart rate. And then I just start by focusing on the feelings, peaceful, happy, calm. And then I focus first on my health in a visualization meditation, and I say, you know, how do I want to look and feel? And I picture myself feeling strong and agile and active and moving and then i picture my relationship and what i want that to feel like then i go to my larger circle my family and friends and i imagine joyous moments of us celebrating together and then i imagine my my work and life goals you know one by one what do i want it to look and feel like and i visualize the end state and i mean when you visualize, it's important to really think of things coming together easily and effortlessly, you know, ultimately learning how to surrender and fully trust yourself that even if you don't have all of the resources, just by having the intention, the resources will come to you, whether that's a skill you need to learn or a person you need to partner with that has that skill. But it will show up as long as you're you're in that state of mind where it's all just going to come together and flow easily. And that's how I meditate. And then I go off and I start my day. <laughs> Beautiful. Okay. Rewire. Mm. Now the rewire is, it's, a, it's an acronym. R-E-W-I-R-E. Rewire. Yeah. And I'll, I'll quickly say what it is, and then we'll go through each of the letters then. Okay. So R is relax in the quiet. E is eliminate the noise. W, what do you need? I Imagine and visualization. R, repeat and rewire, create. E, elevate and expand, go bigger. So that's the big picture. So let me come back to the first R. The first R in rewire is relax and quiet. So back to you. Thank you. Uh, well, so week one is about learning how to relax and quiet the mind because the brain and the central nervous system, you know, we have a very strong stress response called the fight or flight response. And because we evolved for survival and because we live in this really busy society, even when you pick up your phone, I mean, how many, how many things do you have access to? Every time your phone pings, it triggers a stress response because anything that requires your time and energy is going to create that. So First, learning to quiet the mind is the first step because, as we all know, when you're stressed, you're at your least productive. If you can then just learn to quiet the mind, so we have some techniques. We start to develop some self-awareness using mindfulness techniques, and then you learn some meditation. But also in week one, I don't wait until week four to give you the, the fear pattern. We, <laughs> we go into it right in week one. Why? Because in my work in the corporate world, you know, when you're managing big projects, you also have to know, you also have to define what are your barriers to success? What are your risks? You have to sit there and define them. You have to write them out. What is the likelihood of this risk coming up and stopping me from being successful? And so what are the things stopping us from being successful and happy in this life? Well, it's all of those unconscious patterns. So right in week one, you get to go into those five fear patterns and five limiting beliefs and there are so many examples and permutations of how it could show up and the language in how it could show up. And there are case studies. So you're going to read through all of these and you're going to figure out which one or two or three are yours. Not Most people don't have all five. They have one or two, usually two. Some have three, but they're closely tied together. So you get to map out exactly what your barriers to success are. 
because like any goal, you've got you've got a goal, you're going down a highway, you've got your goal at the end state, and all of a sudden you come up through this big barrier and most people don't know how to work around it. So they just go, okay, I guess I'll just stop then. Today's another day to stop. Well, what this gives you is the key to unlock that door so you can either move through it or you can just pick it up and move it aside. So in week one, we cover all of that. Then in week two, the E in rewire, the first E is eliminate the noise. So, you know, I think because we've talked earlier in the show about how most of us are living life according to somebody else's set of expectations because we don't really know what makes us happy. This is about mapping out all of those areas in your life that we think are urgent, that are taking too much of our time and energy and draining us of resource and learning how to just make smarter choices so we can create a little more time and space for us to feel our best. We also go into some positive psychology discussion on ego depletion and what the energetic body is because we don't have an infinite source of energy. We are finite beings and like a battery, we need to recharge. And most of us are running depleted every single day. Most of us wake up tired every day. So the very first step when you're feeling exhausted or burnt out or fatigued is you need to first dial it back and take some time to recharge so you can create space for something new to happen. So that's what we do in week two is you get the tools to learn how to regulate yourself better. And when you are, you know, when you are regulating your energy better, you're more in control of your moods, you're more in control of your willpower and your ability to stay committed to your goals and yourself. So it's an extraordinary amount of tools because, you know, most people have that experience of being moody or tapped of energy and we don't understand that we're acting out simply because we're exhausted. When you're exhausted, you can't be in control of your emotions. So you start to develop that EI quotient, that emotional intelligence quotient in in week two. And then in week three, we actually get to develop your personal plan. So week three is the W. It's what do you need? And what I've come to realize in the coaching world is our needs are non-negotiable. If you have if you have an emotional need that's not being fulfilled, it's going to come out in other ways. So when your needs aren't being fulfilled in different areas of your life, what tends to happen is we I, we become irritable, we become cranky, we become dissatisfied. But over time, it can actually create dis-ease or disease in the body. It can create chronic inflammation. And if you're not processing things in your mental and emotional bodies and in your energetic body, your physical body is going to scream at you. It's going to become your alarm system. And so in week three, just by starting to map out your personal plan, you start to develop an awareness of whose life you've been living and what you actually need to feel your best so that you're living your most excited life, so that you're really thriving in your life, so that you can wake up every day thinking, oh my God, I get to live this life today. This is amazing. So you're shifting now to what is your personal plan for happiness. And it gets so specific. You get to actually write down in a planner how many hours per day or per week you need each particular thing in each area of the life wheel in your life. So that's pretty extraordinary because what I came to realize in my coaching practice is most people don't know how to do that. So, okay, so in week one, we've removed your barriers to success. We've learned to quiet your mind. In week two, we've eliminated the noise. We've helped you manage your energy and your emotions better. In week three, we've created a personal plan, a new plan for what would actually make you happy because, Jeff, what you need is not what I need. And it's not going to be what your parents or your kids or your siblings or your colleagues need or your friends. Everyone is unique. Then in week four, we get to imagine a whole new life. So you learn the secret sauce of manifestation. You learn how energy works and how to keep your vibration at a particular level so that you're attracting into your life what you need and being able to use your brain in a whole new way so you're lighting up your visual your auditory your kinesthetic centers and you're creating a new pathway new neurology for what you want to produce in your life so no longer being on autopilot down here and then in week five 
you know, it's all about repetition, repetition in order for the brain to make that shift to long lasting change. But, you know, if there's a gym that's 30 minutes away and there's one that's five minutes away, which one are we going to choose? We're going to choose the one that's easiest for us, the one that feels better for us. So much like that, you get to create your personal daily practice in week five. And then in week six, because I'm me and this is what I would do for myself, I said, okay, so what if your vision of your life was only this big before and now we've pulled down the walls and now your life is open and limitless to possibility? Well, how about we take it up a notch? How about we go bigger? So in week six, the Elevate and Expand, the final E in in Rewire, not only do you learn how to create a larger vision for yourself, something you couldn't even have fathomed before, and I promise you, if you can imagine it, it does show up. If you can take action, it's going to show up. But you also learn how to stay in that elevated state, how to stay in that new mindset, and how to recognize when you're going off the rails and how to reset and come back. Because I think that was what was missing for me in, in past programs was, you know, you go to a weekend course or a week-long course or you read a great book and you get a few great nuggets and you come back excited. And then after a few weeks, you just spiral back to your old way of being. And I, I just didn't want that to happen. So this is the tools for how to stay in the zone and how to stay in that new mindset so that you can have the happiness and success you deserve. That makes perfect sense. Absolute perfect sense. Okay. I want to go on to something you said earlier. Uh, And it it wasn't what you said earlier here. I've heard you say this a couple of times and I built it into the introduction. And whilst I was putting my research together for you, a phrase that came across to me was goal setting and producing results became second nature to you. Mm -hmm. And I thought, that's very, very profound. That's why I built it into the introduction. So here's what I want to explore based on Rewire and everything else that you've explained. Let's begin with goal setting and I'll drop a few questions here. So I've got four questions. I'll leave you to sort them out however you want to sort them okay. out. Okay, four questions. I'm going to write them. <laughs> Go, okay. okay, okay, okay. You're very process orientated. Wonderful. Is goal setting necessary is the first one. Is there a psychological link between goal setting and generating results? Because you seem to suggest that in the in the comment that you made. And then people set goals, they fail, then they say goals don't work. So as a success coach, you must have come across things like that. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. And then the fourth one, what are the key components for successful goal setting? So Mm. there's there's quite a lot of information there. And I'll I'll let you, with your expertise, merge them into a subject and then you can address them however you wish. Kind of lets me off the hook, really. (laughs) No problem. You just sit back and relax. Yeah, I'll do that. (laughs) I'm ready. Perfect. So your first question was, is goal setting necessary? Well, absolutely. If you want to achieve your goal, you would have to be specific about it because, you know, if you are setting a vague goal, like I'd like to have a lot of money one day, well, a lot of money is a relative term. And depending on who you are and how you're living, it can be defined in so many different ways. If you're, you know, living in a mud hut in Africa, then $100 is a lot of money and $100 would basically buy you a half a dinner in some restaurants in the U.S. So, you know, if you're working a six-figure job and a lot of money is having $7 million in your bank account or $10 million or more, then that is something. So in, you know, going back to the world of process and systems, we talk about KPIs, we talk about key performance indicators. So, when you are delivering a project of any size or delivering on a goal of any size, you need to be able to measure it and you need to be able to determine what are your key performance indicators. In other words, how would you know if you have it? So, you have to get really specific. You want to make 
this amount of money in this amount of time. So we've all heard of SMART goals. They have to be specific. They have to be measurable. They need to be achievable. They need to be realistic, and they need to be time-bound. So, yes, goal setting is necessary if you want to achieve a goal. Not so much if you don't. Um, the next question you had was, is there a psychological relationship with goals and goal setting? And there is. You know, the brain is designed to be efficient. So what it's going to look for is when you're trying to achieve something new, like a new challenge or setting yourself a new goal, maybe loftier than you've had before, um, the brain will say, have we done this before? And have we been successful or not? And again, it's going to go back into unconscious mode. It's going to go into autopilot mode. So if you want to achieve a new goal, you're going to have to figure out what are your barriers to success? What are the resources you need in order to accomplish it? You don't have to be all of the resources, you yourself, and wear that many hats. But you need to know, you know, if you don't have the financial background, do you know someone that's done it? Good. Can you interview them? Can you have them mentor you? Can, can you partner with them, have them teach you? Or can you partner with someone, have them do it with you, have it do it for your business, for example? And removing the barriers of success, well, that really answers the next question is, you know, we have to get in touch with those unconscious patterns and bring them to our conscious awareness because... This affects everything you do. So when I think of goal setting and goal getting, I think your conscious mind, that 5% of you, is the one that sets the goals. That's where you do your critical thinking and your problem solving and your decision making. But it's your unconscious that's your goal getter. So if you have a goal to achieve that next promotion at work or to start that business that you've been thinking of that's been on the shelf for seven years, then, you know, what are you going to do? That's, that's your goal setter. So you have to get really, really specific. And so what ends up happening is most people set themselves a goal. They can even put together a little plan of, you know, all of the things they need to line up in order for you to achieve that goal. But then what you're going to run into is you're going to run into all of those unconscious patterns, those self-doubts, all the fear, all of that, you know, undeservedness, all of those old money beliefs that don't work anymore, that don't serve you in achieving your goal. And unless you bring them together and start this conscious, unconscious integration, you're never going to actually have your goal setter and your goal getter on the same team. They're going to be on opposing teams. That so makes this, great sense. It really, really, really does. I love that. Yeah, and that's what, you know, I I, I think this work and, and tapping into the unconscious is so genius because how can we possibly achieve anything if we're running on 5%? If you could really tap into that unknown, that 95%, and start to bring it into your conscious awareness, now you can hundreds, you harness almost 100% of your power. That's a game changer. That's a complete gear shift. And then what is my successful formula for achieving goals was the last one. Oh, what, what are the key components for yeah. successful goal setting? For successful goal setting. Okay. There's a difference between goal setting and successful goal setting, right? Because what we've spoken about so far is that we have the 5% conscious, the 95% subconscious. We have to get them together. And then we say people set goals and they fail. And we've mm -hmm. explained why. So bring, this question kind of brings the whole thing together and says, it does. Yeah. when we're setting goals, what are the key components for successful goal setting? Well, I would say you need to have... First of all, you know, in order to accomplish anything, you need to have a vision for it and you need to be able to conceive of it. You need to be able to believe that you can. So that's where the unconscious patterns come in because if unconsciously you don't believe you can, that's not going to work. And then you need to take action. You need a plan of action and then you need to take action in order to achieve it. And I would say, you know, we talked about it earlier. We also need to incorporate 
knowing what your obstacles might be and knowing how to remove those obstacles. And part of that is tapping into that unconscious stuff and getting into those fear patterns and, and starting to, to work with those to bring them into conscious. And then finally, what is your evidence procedure? So when you have a final vision for your goal, you need to know very clearly what it's going to bring to your life, when you're going to have it come to bear, and then how will you know when you have it? Because so many people say, for example, I want to make this amount of money, and then 20 years later, they are there, they're living that life, and they're no happier. So remind yourself, what is your evidence procedure? Because when you get there and you've achieved it, you can actually feel a huge sense of accomplishment. Your brain can catalog the victory and success and say, now that I've done this, I know I can do anything else. That's, you know, that's really important. I was asked a question a couple of weeks ago. I was mentoring a group of guys and one of them said, I've achieved some great stuff in my life. Mm -hmm. but I'm not happy or I'm unfulfilled. Maybe that's different to happy. And I said, uh huh. He said, is this it? Is this life? We just keep going. And I said, here's what I suggest. You set a goal a while ago. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I said, you've now fulfilled that goal. He went, yeah. I said, what you didn't do is stop, celebrate, enjoy, and then set another goal. Yes. It's really important that you stop and celebrate. And he said, okay, what do I need to do to celebrate and how long should it take? <laughs> <laughs> I said, man, man, that's, that's different for everyone. <laughs> But the important thing, as you've just said, and I come across this one a lot, Zara, is this is where the wonderful world of key performance indicators come in. You identify where you are, you decide where you want to be, and the key performance indicators map your journey. When you get there, stop, celebrate, be thankful. Yes. Show gratitude. And then reset, set another goal, go again and you will be fulfilled otherwise Absolutely. yeah this is a very genius um point you're making here because we are actually because we evolved to be good at survival we have something called a negativity bias built in which means our brains are on high alert for danger so that's why when you do something, whether it's a presentation at school or a presentation at work or finish a big project or something big in life that you've achieved, you know, if a hundred people say, oh my God, that was fantastic. It was so inspirational. You did such a great job. And one person says to you, you know, I think it would have been good if you added a case study about this. What do you pay attention to? Do you pay attention to the hundred accolades you just got and the compliments and the, you know, the, the gratitude and thanks for the work you're bringing, or do you pay attention to the one criticism? And this is a perfect example. Part of retraining the brain, and this is also in the rewire system, is we need to learn to expand those good moments and celebrate that. Let those emotions and feelings fill you up and fill your neurology because as you do that, you're retraining the brain for victory. You're retraining the brain for how good it feels and how easy and effortless it can be if you just allow yourself to feel it for a moment. And so you're retraining away from that negativity bias and retraining yourself to stay in that high positive mindset. It's genius. It's really wonderful. Yeah. Another one uh, you spoke about there. Do we pay notice to the 99 compliments or do we pay notice to the one that is less kind. What came to mind for me there is, can we retrain our brain to deal with that? Now, I'll give you a personal story. Mm. So I gave you a little bit of my history before we came on air, and my life was suppressed and lots of things happened that kept me held back. And I just got to a point that enough I'm, I'm just not going to do this anymore. And the way it manifested itself, I was uh, working as a management consultant and I had the idea 
for this book, the KPI book, all about key performance indicators. And I took the I took the idea, great name for a booker. Huh? I took the idea to the managing director of the company and he said, No, that book will never sell. Nobody would be interested in buying such a book. And in any event, you are not the person to write that book. Mm. You know, and I said, okay. I walked out of the room and I reframed what he said because you could easily, very easily um, be defeated by people like that and comments like that. So what I did, I said, you know, he's giving me his limitations, not mine. Mm. And we've spoken about purpose and having goals and what we can see and what the universe is passing to you. And I felt I had to do this book. He was not privy to those dreams. He was not privy to all the experiences that I had. So the only answer he could give was what he gave, which is okay. I can understand that. So I thought, I'll go ask some other people. Other people all said the same thing. No, that's a really bad idea. No, we'll buy that book. No one's interested. And you're not the person to write it. So they're telling me I'm not worthy. And I'm like, mm -hmm. I had enough of this in my life. So I yes. wrote the book anyway. Good for you. <laughs> <laughs> and look, the interesting thing, um, it's now on record as the most successful book in history on the subject of key performance indicators and business management. Now, here's the fascinating bit. All of those people go, well, yeah, I could have written that book. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like, yeah, but you didn't. Mm. You didn't. And so in all of all of that, there's I'll, I'll leave the person listening to pull all of that together because I didn't say it to impress you. I said it to impress upon you what you've been saying, Zara, and, and that is we're wired for defence. We're not wired for victory, and it's so easy to get slammed by other people and even your own thoughts. So it is about retraining your brain and reframing it so it suits your purpose. Yes, absolutely. I could even take it a step further, honestly, Jeff, and say that sometimes... You know, if, if the world we constructed is all our projection, then when we set a goal for ourselves, sometimes we're projecting that all of those unconscious beliefs, until they're conscious, we're projecting all of those unconscious beliefs and so they will show up in the people we know and the people we love. And they will say these things to us because it's actually our own unconscious saying, are you the right person to write this book? Are you the right person to do it now? Is this work, book worth reading? And good on you that you managed to recognize it and work through it because in the coaching world, we work with that construct a lot. So, you know, and, and I had the same thing when I was writing this book. Who am I to write this book? Will it connect with people? And I'm getting amazing feedback because I just pushed through it because I knew, again, because we are wired for survival, it is our own survival mechanism that is trying to keep us safe. We don't want to feel bad. We don't want to fail at anything. So let's not try. And that's how that mechanism works. And so that fear pattern shows up. And the strategy that shows up is, okay, maybe we just don't do that because we won't be successful at it. Because it feels much better to be successful at it, right? Sure, so absolutely. That's how, it, that's how it shows up and plays out. And all you have to do, if, if you can, like, like you did, Jeff, and reframe it, is just bring that unconscious stuff to the foreground and say, I recognize that this is what it is. I'm going to do it anyway. And then it just shifts. And it has less and less power over you the more practice you have with it. Amazing. Okay, well, thank you for that. So I've given you one of my stories. So here's my question for you now. What's been one of the toughest challenges that you have faced in your life? And how did you overcome it? 
Oh, which one do I choose? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I would say that that limiting belief um, that I wasn't good enough because it permeated literally every area of my life. And, you know, you can retrain the brain, but it doesn't completely disappear. You just have more power over it because your ability to be wired for survival still exists as long as you're alive. So learning how to live with it and make peace with it and say, thank you. I appreciate you're trying to protect me. You can, you know, it's, it's this, and it takes time to develop how to develop a relationship with your unconscious. And so your unconscious mind is really, it's your soul, your spirit, your essence, your soul is much bigger than this body and it wants to do great things and it wants to do the good work, you know, in other words. Um, but your physical body and this construct that we're in, in this neurological self, which is wired for survival, is constantly going to be saying, but do you really think it's going to be fine? You know, and it doesn't matter. And And soon enough over time, that voice just gets lower and lower and smaller and smaller and smaller until you have almost complete power over it. But then it'll show up in other ways. It'll, it'll pop up here and there. You know, you'll have a friend say, but, Oh, you know, I'll, I'll ask this other person because they have these skills. And I thought I, I have all of those same exact skills that you just listed <laughs> off, but it's fine. <laughs> it's fine. Yeah. You just learn to say, Thank you, little voice. You can go away now. I'm going to do it anyway. You should know me. Be afraid. The minute I'm up, I'm getting to it, and it's going to happen. So quiet down now. And it's just learning to master that relationship. I think that's wonderful. You know what I love about that Mm -hmm. is that when you hear that, let's call it our survival voice that's coming there to protect you, Mm -hmm. you talk to it and say, thanks very much. Now go away. That's, I love that. I do the same. And I, I, I go, aha, I've caught you. So it becomes quite fun as well. It's like, thank yeah. you for the warning. I'll assess the warning and then I'm going to decide what to do. But thank you. And then, and then go. And, and having re- that relationship with yourself, mm-hmm. it probably sounds insane to some people listening now. <laughs> <laughs> you, <laughs> And I, I, I said to a friend a few weeks ago, I said, you know when you get that voice in your head? He said, yeah, yeah. I said, whose voice is it? Is it mm. your voice? And that was the beginning of a very deep conversation, which we're not going to go into right now, Zara. I think I'll get you wow. back on another show for that one and plenty more. But I, I have a question now that I ask every guest that comes onto the show. What is the most important thing you've ever learned? The most important thing that I've ever learned. I would say, you know, we come into this world feeling pretty uncertain. And what I've come to understand is that we all are meant to be here with a powerful connection to this earth and to each other. And the minute we learn to love ourselves, but really truly unconditionally love and accept ourselves and step into our power and who we are meant to be in this world, everything shifts. Our relationship with other people is, you know, it's a connection on a different level because if you can love yourself, then you're ready to love another. If you can love yourself, then you have all of the faith and the trust that you can achieve whatever it is you set your mind to. If you can love and accept yourself, then you want to be here in service of others and help people do the same. And and so in learning that, I've realized that so much of our suffering is unnecessary if we just had the tools to expand our consciousness and move beyond. And I think I think for me, that was the most important lesson that okay. I am powerfully meant to be here. And so are you. Okay. I want to pull something out of that. <laughs> so I know it's it's a habit of mine. <laughs> so what you said was at some points and I'm paraphrasing here at some point you changed who you were 
and mm. you learn to love yourself. Mm. Here's my question, because I've gone through this journey too. Did you find that when you did that, the people in your life changed? Or did you meet different kind of people? Great question. I think it gave me a deeper level of intuition in terms of what felt wrong or right for me, what was good or bad for me. So my, my intuition was sharpened to a point where I could immediately say yes or no. And the minute I was able to clear a space with what didn't work, I then knew how to ask for and attract what I wanted. So yes, the people in my life that I loved I don't think they changed, but our relationship shifted without even trying just because I was showing up differently. And if I'm not projecting that they don't love me, then I'm projecting pure love because I love myself. I love you. I have compassion for all living beings and I want the best for the world. How could that person not show up interacting differently? So everything shifts in the most amazing ways. Everyone gets kinder and lovelier and more wonderful and you know there are some negative forces that will always be there and and you just learn how to manage them with a lot more grace and ease they don't upset you as much anymore they don't disturb your peace anymore and anything i find or come across that does disturb my peace no thank you moving on and things just flow more gently and freely more easily Yes, I found that too. A subject for another show, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so your book, Six Weeks to Happiness. Someone is going, Jeff, you told me ages ago that we're going to find out how we can get our hands on this book. It's a six week <laughs> program. It's rewire. We've heard all about it. I love it. I want it. Zara, how do we get our hands on your book? All you have to do is go to sixweekstohappy.com. And what I've done, Jeff, for your audience is I've made the free ebook available on download on that website as well. So the first thing they'll do is they'll get to download their personal planner, their personal formula for happiness, and then just follow the steps to buy the book. The book is also turning into a coaching program so we could do live coaching and work the six weeks together with me as your coach for six weeks. And I can't wait to be part of your journey. Just go to sixweekstohappy.com and start your journey today. That's awesome. Zara Carson, you have been absolutely amazing. I have loved every moment. And for sure, we're going to get you back on the show. There's so much more I want to ask you. But um, we have to do that another time, of course. So Zara, thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Oh, my That's absolute my, my absolute delight. Well, thank you for listening to The Secrets of Success. I hope the show has helped ignite your passion to be a catalyst for action and giving you the fuel you need to realize your dreams. If you've enjoyed the show, please hit the like button, leave a review and share. It really does make a huge difference because without your help, we can't succeed. So please go ahead, share the program with just one person who you know, maybe a family member, maybe a friend. You never know the difference that you might make to their lives. On another note, I'm always searching for great success stories. So if you'd like to be a guest on the show or you'd like to nominate a guest, please contact me on our website at jeff-smith.com. You know, I really would love to hear from you. That's all from me. Thank you again for listening and have a great day.